But we have um, here today with us is Dr. Ben Sweden. And so Ben is from, I mean, he teaches architecture and design at the University of Brighton, but Ben has studied architecture at the University of Cambridge and the Bartlett. Um, and his research interests include ways in which uh, design can contribute to ethics um, as well as vice versa. And, you know, um, I guess for us, for this conversation, it's also this kind of work he has been doing on ethics, particularly, uh, you know, his thesis is titled Architecture and Undecidability. So the, the kind of ethics that he's been talking about is in the context of, you know, how do we make these decisions when the, the decisions are not necessarily like good and bad decisions. So basically the kind of bigger problems context. And also, um, the idea that the way he talks about ethics is not ethical theory in the sense of like, you know, philosophy that is out there, which exists, but something that kind of emerges in your design practices. So this kind of um, level of ethics, I think, is very important to this contemporary ecological design um, discussion. So thank you very much, Ben, for, for, for being with us today. And I would like to invite you to start your um presentation. Great, thanks Domini. Um, thanks, yeah, pleasure to be here today and really nice to um, uh, have the opportunity to kind of add into this really interesting studio that you're all engaged with. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk for I think about half an hour and then I'm hoping that maybe Domini first and um, uh, will kind of prompt me to sort of expand on this. Um, the kind of initial talk I'll um, keep in a relatively straight line on, which won't necessarily touch on everything, but we can kind of enrich from there. Um, and as a talk, it's, I think in some places, supposed to be a little bit provocative. Um, the idea is to um, try and expand the notion we have of sustainability and design uh, beyond um, beyond the kind of common discourse of it and to find other ways that design can contribute. Um, and uh, yeah, that we can kind of follow up in other ways, kind of enriching. Okay, so um, design is in a broad sense at the very center of ecological crisis. And there are several ways this is um, the case. Over here. Um, and firstly, you've got the idea or, or the way that design disciplines are um, a cause of environmental harm and have been historically. Um, so sort of top left on this slide is the architect, uh, architecture declares a climate emergency, um, noting the amount of CO2 that's produced by the building industry. Um, designed artifacts consume and embody energy, they create pollution, they deplete resources, they destroy habitats. Uh, historically, the Industrial Revolution, which is where many modern design disciplines were developed, that this um, caused a lot of the historic carbon that's in the atmosphere. Uh, on dealing with the historic carbon is one of the kind of more complicated um, questions because you know, that was produced by people who may be producing less now, but um, they don't necessarily want to take ownership of what they did 100 years ago and so on. So design's really at the center of the problem. On the other hand, the kind of urgency of action, so the, the need to act requires a response from designers, not just to mitigate those harms, not just to undo what they've done, um, or, but also to design very different ways of going on in the world. So to change things, not just improve them. So we need kind of... Uh, Designally action in order to um, do things differently. But as many of the current environmental problems stem from design work, right, from the unanticipated consequences of previous well intentioned design activity, we need a lot of care in composing how those design interventions work when we're kind of addressing an ecological challenge, right? So um, uh, it's possible to. There are lots of examples, I'll give one later, where um, designers are trying to do something good, they're trying to solve a problem, but actually this creates other problems. And this is, in a way, is um, kind of part of what's going on in responding to the climate emergency. 
and what I'll try and do with referring to, to Gregory Bateson in this lecture is to kind of position design as kind of double-edged in this way, um, as something we need to kind of, uh, kind of look at in more than one way all the time. Um, so the idea of this lecture is to develop a way of thinking that expands the extent of the opportunities and responsibilities um, that come with designing for um, environmental crisis, uh, to move beyond just the mitigation of harm, um, uh, the kind of improvement of current practices, to move beyond that way of thinking about design's involvement. And um, so, we have here, uh, to do this, we're gonna um, use like, some ideas from Gregory Bateson. Um, his most, most important book is top right here. I think you've read some excerpts from this, um, from Steps to an Ecology of Mind. And um, Bateson was working in many fields. He, he passed away, I think in 1980. Um, he'd been working active since the thirties. He kind of moved across all kinds of discourses. And in the last decade or so, from the late 60s onwards, um, he became explicitly concerned with ecology and ecological crisis. And this became a kind of unifying uh, theme for all his work. So when he puts it together, it steps to an ecology of mind as like a collection of papers over his whole career. And his career looks like a kind of nomadic, chaotic process. He does um, stuff on schizophrenia. He does stuff, uh, does uh, cultural anthropology. He does, um, I think it's uh, is it work with dolphins and language, I think something like that. Um, uh, he's part of the cybernetics group. He's sort of moving all across the disciplinary map and then he puts it together and it turns out to make complete coherent sense as one book, um, which is a, a kind of amazing kind of retrospective moment, I think. And the lens really, I think is ecology. Um, there's many differences in referring back to this, so it's from 1972 and some of the works earlier, there's many differences in context. Um, so for instance, the environmental crises of the 60s and 70s were around uh, pollution, they weren't really around climate, um, but many of the underlying drivers and the resulting dilemmas are very similar. So I think there's something, um, some things just haven't, you know, are still there, some of, some of the things that are identified then. Um, so they persist. I think it's very interesting always to look at the things that persist, right? What are, what are the underlying drivers of things? So um, Bateson doesn't really engage with design particularly directly, um, but his thinking relates to design, I think, in two kinds of ways, that there's two kinds of connections that are happening. So first, he draws a contrast between um, the kind of systemic relationships that you find in ecological systems and in social systems, uh, which tend towards a kind of homeostatic balance um, between the different elements. So um, in a woodland, for instance, uh, as a kind of population of one thing grows, there are feedback loops that stop everything going into runaway, right? Everything's kind of checking and balancing on each other. And it can, it's not just fixed in one place, it can move into other um, patterns of um, stability, but everything is always kind of, it's very kind of being is all kind of interconnected um, across all the different things. And he contrasts that with the kinds of actions that humans do, which he calls conscious purpose. So rather than um, the, in contrast to those kind of systemic relationships in like a woodland, um, we kind of act in terms of what our conscious um, plans are. And what these do is they tend to focus only on part of the situation and probably what our needs are, right? So we kind of think, um, uh, think about only one part of the situation, we have some kind of goal, we go and try and achieve that. And this is a very different kind of action than the way that ecologies work. And part of his diagnosis of ecological crisis is the, the conflicts between these two um, ways of going on and the way that um, 
human culture kind of works in this way that um, is only ever addressing part of the situation. So that's the first one. Uh, and conscious purpose is very similar to design, especially design as a kind of it, when design is like an instrumental problem solving type approach. So you can see here he's positioning design as really being at the root of ecological crisis, not just in the sense that, you know, it's created some carbon, it's created some pollution, but that kind of thinking is in uh, conflict. Excuse me, Ben, one moment. Uh, sure. this is still, you, you're still in the first slide, right? Yeah, yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to, it's minimal slides, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the um, uh, kind of design as a way of thinking is in contrast with um, uh, the kinds of systemic relationships you you would get in nature um, and so designs kind of even the kind of thinking is in is part of the ecological crisis so that's the first kind of way um, the, the second is where he highlights um, aesthetic practices so um, and he's really thinking of things like arts and cultural practices and here's where parts of the parts of human culture are kind of you know systemically participating in ecology so they're not kind of driven by um, conscious purpose and these of course can be also ways of designing and things that we design and design for okay um, so I'll try and give some examples of those later um, the main kind of overview of the lecture then is um, uh, whereas we tend to see um, uh, design's relationship to ecological crisis as a sense of mitigating harm, um, there are kind of other things we need to do as well. So we need to do that. We need to, um, the, the image on the bottom here is from my colleague, Duncan Baker Brown, who's an innovator in circular economy in the building industry. This is a building built entirely, entirely from waste. And this is not just kind of reducing the amount of waste that's produced or saving embodied energy, it's redesigning the building industry, right? So it's kind of having a, a, um, a transformative effect. And I, I would say that's a kind of good practice example of um, an approach to environmental questions in the building industry. My background's in architecture, so they're the examples I'll speak to most. But I don't think these are enough by themselves. I think we need more than this. So oh, um, the urgency of the climate crisis invites an urgent response, right? And um, it's understandable in these circumstances to turn towards a kind of problem solving approach. And what we do when we do this is um, we focus on things that can be easily defined, that can be isolated and that can be solved. So we need to act so we identify something we can act on. But because everything's interconnected in an ecological system, to treat just one aspect of the situation can be problematic, leading to unanticipated consequences elsewhere. So our kind of, um, just because we've narrowed our focus onto one thing, doesn't mean we're not also affecting everything else. And um, an example of this, imagine a relatively localized uh, environmental challenge like soil degradation in a field, right? So um, intensive farming destroys the structure of the soil. Um, so how do you repair that? And if you think about this as a primarily technical problem, the destruction of the soil can be repaired by reintroducing the structure um, or the nutrients that are lost. And we developed a technology for doing this called fertilizer. Um, uh, and I guess also practices, so chemical fertilizers, but also natural practices of doing this, right? And we replace the lost nutrients in the field. And if you focus narrowly, so if, you're, if you only consider as the um, context, if you only think about the field or maybe the farm, it seems like the problem is solved because what is taken out of the field is put back in. And one could actually call this net zero, right? Which is the current kind of, you know, best hope of um, the 
uh, climate conference at the moment, right? It's how quickly we can achieve net zero. Well, here, if you think about a field, we're losing some nutrients, we're putting them back in, it's net zero, right? Um, this allows for maintaining the, the um, productivity of the fields, you can maintain the high yields, you can decrease the cost of food. And they all seem like good things when you're only thinking about the field. But while the field may continue to be productive, we've completely changed how, how it works as a kind of ecosystem. So what would have been circular um, with the kind of uh, dying off of things, kind of refeeding the nutrients and the structure of the soil has now become linear because of the human intervention. So we put things in at one point and they run off at another and then we need to put them back in again. And this leads to consequences elsewhere, right? Um, so beyond the boundary of the field, beyond the frame of the problem, beyond what we were considering. The fertilizers run off, they collect in water courses, they lead to algal blooms. These in turn deplete oxygen levels and they destroy aquatic ecosystems. And this was a big issue in the 70s. Um, this is uh, uh, when Bateson's writing, this top image here is Lake Erie, um, which is an example he refers to. And you can see the algal bloom and um, the, uh, which is kind of killing Lake Erie as an ecosystem. And what happens here is it forms a kind of reinforcing cycle. So, um, which is, a, I guess, a cybernetic idea, right? It's um, a feedback loop and you become more and more dependent. I guess the feedback loop happens socially, right? Rather than um, environmentally, um, we become more and more dependent on the fertilizers. Uh, and you can think of this as a kind of addiction. And I won't go into this so much, but Bateson connects a lot of his ecological thinking with his thinking about mental health and um, sees this all as one thing. So the, the, our mental worlds and the ecological worlds as one kind of interconnected um, system. So you can, you can look at this and you can think, well, okay, we, we just need some organic farming practices, right? We need to just stop using fertilizers. But you can't just undo the intervention. So in the meantime, society is developed in ways that are dependent on the increased yields and the decreased prices. So um, if you don't, use the fertilizers you have other costs and that means that not everyone can afford the produce so this has social consequences um, there's also things about the land use um, which are not so easy and without going into that in detail the, the point I want to make is that part of the difficulty of working through the questions comes from previous attempts to solve them so, so um, you can't just undo undo an ecological intervention or a design intervention. You have the, um, uh, I think in, it relates to the idea of wicked problems, which Domini may have introduced you to, um, the idea that everything is a one, sh one shot operation. You can't undo it. Um, once it's done, you, this has consequences that um, uh, ripple through the system you're working in. And from that, I think you get the idea that you have to be really careful about the kinds of problem solving we do, even in an emergency, even in the urgency to act, because we can build in, um, we can make the situation worse. And part of Bateson's contribution is to write about ad, um, the risk of ad hoc solutions to ecological crisis. So where we end up treating the symptoms or the effects rather than or without addressing the causes. So if we kind of scale this up from the kind of fields to um, climate crisis, if we think of this as a, a primarily technical problem and plenty of the discourse and the press, the science on this kind of does treat it that way, um, there's a risk of treating only the symptoms and leaving the underlying causes untouched. And I don't mean by this kind of giving up and treating only the um, consequences like rising tides and so on. Um, so focus first, uh, if, if, the, if the 
problem is characterized as the planet getting too hot, this can be solved by cooling the planet down. Right. It sounds like it solves the problem if you think the problem is global heating. And there are some, th th this kind of view has led to um, various kind of geoengineering projects, um, which are obviously bad ideas, but are still taken seriously because everyone's so desperate for a, um, for a, a silver bullet, right? For a problem solving um, thing. Um, so one of the more credible ones, the, the, the most amazingly uncredible one is the giant space mirror. Do Google that one. Um, the, the one that I think is interesting to think about is bottom left here, or, or bo both bottoms, radical plan to artificially cool the earth. Could be safe, experts worry. Um, this is called sulfuric aerosol injection, and this is to mimic a um, volcano. So um, when we have a big volcano, we have these particles that go into the stratosphere, and this stops sunlight reaching the earth, which cools the earth down or stops it heating up. And this would be a plan to intentionally artificially seed the stratosphere with aerosols, which would stop the earth heating by reflecting sunlight away. And this is um, a kind of fantastically bad idea. Um, two of the reasons why would be you become committed to doing this forever, right? So you can't stop doing this because then you get a kind of heat shock. Um, and second, it's a high technology solution that would be run by certain, need to be organized by certain parts of the world, um, but uh, would have differential effects across the globe, right? It would work differently in different places. So there's kind of, you know, you have effects in one place, power in another, you have um, maybe some huge problems there. So the bad, you know, bad idea practically, um, but also it's really clearly treating the symptoms. It's not, a la not really addressing any of the underlying causes. And so you might say, well, the cause of heating is carbon dioxide. And what we need to do is focus on not emitting carbon dioxide and removing carbon dioxide. And this is, um, uh, you know, probably the main discourse of ecological crisis at the moment. Um, a focus of attention right now is carbon sequestration. So either through natural processes and um, uh, potentially through technologies. And again, this is around the idea of net zero. Um, so removing as much carbon as we put out. So addressing that um, does address the cause of the heating, right? But removing carbon dioxide isn't enough on its own. It kind of depends what else we do. And the world could become addicted to this treatment. So we, if we continue um, to, to expand the economy, um, we may need to continue to expand carbon sequestration. Um, eventually, there's no more forests you can plant and so on. So we um, need to kind of do more than this. You can't just um, do this. You need to step up again and ask what the causes are. And ultimately, of course, climate change is itself a symptom, right? It's not the, it's not the underlying problem. The problem goes deeper. Uh, climate change is a symptom of humans' relation to the environment. Um, even if climate change is averted, there are many other ecological crises to address. And um, maybe some of the interesting things to be careful of are how um, attempts to address climate crisis create other environmental problems. Um, for instance, the shift to electric cut vehicles requires a massive expansion of batteries, which involves lithium mining, which destroys certain habitats. So these are um, other things that are easy to forget about when we just focus on one thing at a time. Okay, right. writing in 1970, um, and this is a, uh, in, in Steps to an Ecology of Mind, it's actually a report to um, a government inquiry. Um, uh, so it's written in maybe less philosophical than Bateson's other papers. Um, I quite like it as a starting point. Um, and it's an essay called uh, Roots of e Ecological Crisis, I think. And Bateson identifies three um, drivers which are underlying uh, and which end 
uh, interconnected and have the potential to reinforce themselves and each other. And this is just one way of characterizing the situation. It also needs a bit of updating from 1970 to now, but I think it's very relevant to design. And I think it's um, kind of interesting way to locate design in um, Bateson's thought. So the first of these, he labels population. And I think a better, um, better label would be growth for this. Um, so this is the idea in an in a ecosystem, there's always the potential for growth. Uh, ecosystems that don't grow um, don't survive. So they always have the potential to do this, and this is um, then brought into uh, a kind of stability, imagining the woodland, through the relationships with other things that are growing. Um, when we think of this in terms of humans, it's not just about population increase, but about the increase in the demands that we make uh, of the environment. So, so not just about having more humans, but about humans making more demands. So growth is, is a useful um, way of conceiving this. Um, you know, there's a, a it's partly kind of the growth of the humans on the planet as a civilization, partly the idea of growth in the economy, partly the growth of um, consumption, um, us uh, consuming more resources. And of course, this is very unequal, right? This is very unequal across the world. Um, and one of the things with this driver is it's quite hard to act on. So um, you will have come across the idea of degrowth, uh, which is a um, focus in sustainability discourse, but this is quite hard to do. So, um, to, you know, you have some people in the world that are consuming more and using more resources. It's quite hard to get them to agree not to, right? It's maybe you can get them to agree not to consume any more, but it's hard to get them to consume less. Um, and then you have other people in the world who are um, maybe not consuming so much, um, but it's not very just to um, prevent them from consuming more as much as other people, right? So you have difficulties of politics in addressing this, and you have difficulties of um, acting in socially just ways. So this is a difficult thing to kind of move into reverse. And even the idea of growth is baked into some um, sustainability thinking, like sustainable development. Um, this is even, you know, part of how um, the environmental movement has had to package itself to, uh, you know, to get a hearing. Um, the second root cause Bateson identifies as technology. And you can think of this as uh, notice how this is interconnected with population. So as um, you know, human needs and desires grow, new technologies are developed that support these. In turn, these enable further growth, uh, further consumption, and also further technologies. So you can see how these things might drive each other. And this has been happening for, um, you know, since human civilization uh, began. Uh, but in the past century or so, our technologies have reached the point where they impact the planetary ecosystem, not just the local ones. So we're no, no, it's not just that we're um, using technology to reshape the ecosystems that are local to us, but these are having an effect on the planet. So we're scaling up, um, massively scales up our consequences. Um, it's very difficult to undo technological developments because we depend on them. We depend on the ones we've um, done. So um, as I mentioned with the agriculture example, we can't just go back to pre-modern agriculture. You can't just move back um, because the world is now dependent on, and again, you can read this in Bateson as addicted to uh, modern ones. So we kind of, uh, you know, if you just move back to pre-modern agriculture across the world, you're not making enough food for everyone to um, survive. And that's not to say that there aren't things to learn from pre-modern um, methods of agriculture, and maybe looking at those can help us design new practices and new ways forward, right? 
so um, there's something about um, looking back to go forward maybe here but it's you can't just roll roll technology backwards now improvements in technologies where much of the energy in sustainable design gets addressed right that's much of the discourse and um, we're all making devices that consume less energy, that consume less material, um, that use renewable energy um, sources, uh, and developing circular economies to reduce waste. So my colleague Duncan, the waste house I showed at the beginning, um, these are reconceptions of um, uh, ways of building that um, stop the kind of acceleration of ecological damage through technology. And these strategies all slow the impact of technology, right? They're slowing this down, but they don't reverse it. Or well, they don't reverse it by themselves. Um, efficiencies in some places are taken up by um, new activities elsewhere. So my computer may be more efficient, but I'd probably use it more than 10 years ago, right? Um, we might reduce um, carbon emissions somewhere, but suddenly we have lots of people kind of building rockets to fly to the moon. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, it kind of, you know, making the individual, the, the, the individual piece of technology less damaging um, isn't enough on its own. You have to kind of have this wider um, lens. Okay, and then the third route, um, which Bateson calls hubris, which means a bit like uh, um, overconfidence or um, tragic flaw. And this is our tendency to see nature as something to compete with. Um, so this is a um, pattern in certainly Western civilization and in uh, much of human culture. And this is seeing nature as something separate to human culture, something to be controlled and overcome through the use of technology and see nature as a resource to exploit, um, which is um, kind of embedded in a lot of the ways that human civilization works. And this um, assumption is reinforced by technological successes so um, over the centuries of human civilization, the environment becomes tamed and ordered according to human needs. So we, um, for instance, we uh, learn to dam a river, which stops it flooding. We, you know, this is a technological solution that's serving our needs, it allows us to um, increase the yields of the farm and so on. Um, and it builds the um, understand builds an understanding or a conception of our relationship to the world as the world being something outside of us for us to control. And to see the climate crisis as a problem to be solved, so uh, something to solve through a kind of ingenious development of technology is a form of this, right? It's the form of thinking that that. Um, uh, that we can master it, we can overcome it. The problems with the kinds of technological solutions to the climate crisis, so at the most extreme, the geoengineering kind of examples I gave, but I think also the um, uh, making technologies more efficient and mitigating the harm that new developments do and so on, it's not just that they neglect the causes. So it's not if we focus only on a technological approach, we're neglecting these causes, right? We're dealing with only the symptoms. It's also that they reinforce the causes. So if we overcome climate change through technological ingenuity, which we might do, we've actually reinforced the driver or hubris of an ecological crisis more generally. So we've kind of embedded and exacerbated those causes, which will come out later in different crises. Um, so if we develop ways of removing carbon dioxide from the air, this allows us to grow our economies further and we increase our feeling of hubris and mastering the environment. Now, each of the three causes that Bateson identifies are closely related to design. So technology is the realm of design. This is what we're doing. 
um, growth is enabled by design and drives design. And um, the designed artifacts we make, buildings, products, services, um, these are part of how nature and culture have come to be seen in opposition. Bateson thinks, so writing in 1970, Bateson thinks we need to address at least one of these three. And he selects hubris as the one to act on because of the difficulties of acting on the other two. It's really hard to roll technology back, you can slow it down. It's really hard to roll growth back, again, you can slow it down. Um, maybe hubris is the one that can be more of a game changer. And I think we could say that the environmental movement has done that since the 70s. So um, there's some progress, at least in a different kind of environmental awareness. And we can see this as cascading through the kinds of technologies we're making and our attitude to growth, different ideas of the economy are being developed, which are not dependent on continual growth. But this hasn't been enough so far. Um, and we still think of, you know, we're still always beginning to think of environmental crisis as a kind of technical problem. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, Bateson sees aesthetic practices as ways to counter hubris, creating patterns that connect, which can be thought of as where the kinds of patterning that is part of the ecological system is continued into our culture. So our culture starts to be part of the ecological um, system, not simply in the shape of it or um, representing it or um, not harming it, part, part of it integrated. And everything we design is a chance to act on this. So buildings make our um, relations to, oh, here we go, there we go. Buildings make our relation to uh, the environment um, very literally, right? They establish the kind of uh, boundaries we have between um, what we think of as uh, nature, what we think of as culture. Uh, clothes do too. Right, again, very literally. And products and services um, also do this in a, in a less literal way, but they're still a large part of how we understand and mediate the world around us. Uh, the examples I'm gonna give are architectural ones because that's my discipline and it's the one that I can um, talk about with um, most confidence. Um, but a, a few from other disciplines, um, I'm sh I hope that maybe you can think of examples that make sense for you too. So the way architecture relates us to um, eco ecology, to nature, is often by disconnecting us. And that's what it's done historically. By keeping the weather out, by keeping animals out, and allowing us to have control over, that's hubris again, right? Have control over internal spaces, their temperature, who's allowed to come in, who's allowed to go out. This contributes to us seeing the two as being separate. Um, and that idea is a pattern that's built into our cities and into our everyday lives, right? That's the relation to ecology that we're living, even if we understand it differently. And um, to give maybe the most obvious examples, um, this is on the top is Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House. And this on the left, you know, is this kind of, um, kind of modern, part of the modern architecture style that is just touching the ground very slightly, has feel you can really distinguish between a really sharp contrast between the artificial thing, the building and the um, tree and the um, grass, right? And it embodies an idea that these two are very separate worlds and they just touch. And of course that's not true. And the river, which is nearby, doesn't agree with that and invades the building periodically, which you can see on the top right. right? So it, living in the building makes us think of these as two separate worlds. They're not two separate worlds. But then when it floods, we think this is a problem. Right? We think this is a disaster. Um, uh, but um, that's set up by our tendency to think of this relation as something to control. And there are some counter examples. And um, this is bottom left is the Hundertrasser house um, by the artist Hundertrasser, which have a, a very blurred relation between inside and out. Um, Hundertrasser wrote something called the Mold Manifesto, 
um, which is about um, kind of stopping architecture from excluding uh, mold and insects and, and nature. Um, so this has a much kind of more blurred idea of what the connection is. But um, the next one along to middle bottom, um, which is the flower tower in Paris, um, I want to use this example to say that it's, it's not simply about having some green things attached. So um, the flower tower, I don't know if you've seen this building, but it's um, uh, a kind of block of flats. It has these um, trees built around it. I think these are good for biodiversity, probably. I think they also work as um, kind of seasonal shading aspects. So there's lots of good things about this building. But what's the idea, what's the pattern that this architecture suggests? It suggests a pattern where trees are in, where nature is encased in concrete flower pots and put to work for um, shading purposes, right? So that's the, that's the pattern that that building suggests. And you can think of lots of maybe commercial um, buildings incorporating green elements in maybe um, similar, similar ways. So this is a, the pattern here is one of a kind of a framing of nature still and um, still of a kind of uh, separation and control relationship. And then I've got the waste house reappearing here again. Um, so I think this also has a, um, a sense of pattern that connects. And although um, this is designed really in the sense of um, like how to mitigate the uh, consequences of waste in, in the building industry. Um, it becomes very present in the building that you're living in a building built entirely from um, things humans have thrown away. And this I think has a patterning, right? This has a, a, a connection that we start to uh, make. Okay. Um, so a major theme, so I'm gonna step back from that in a way they're the obvious examples. This is the bit that's maybe a bit more surprising, hopefully. Um, a major theme of the classical tradition in Western architecture has been concerned with embodying humans' relation to the world and situating humans in it, right? That the way that um, the idea of hubris, right, is kind of something that architecture's always been speaking to, right? How, how do we sit in the world? And um, religious buildings, uh, I'm using top left here, um, which is San Apollinaria and Classa in Ravenna, um, are ordered with a kind of vertical spatial and spiritual order. So um, they're arranged deductively from God at the top with everything else organized in a kind of spiritual spatial hierarchy below. And this was the um, medieval picture of uh, the world, right? Both spiritually and spatially. And a lot of architecture's language was developed in that um, tradition. Um, Bateson actually refers to this, or refers to something very close to it called um, the Great Chain of Being, um, an illustration of which is on the right. This is a biological idea, med kind of medieval um, and earlier um, idea of the biological ordering of the world which is that, um, again, you have God at the top and you have creation organized as a deductive hierarchy from the more complex beings, um, those with those that are spiritual to ones that are bodied and down to the, you can see the kind of simpler plants and, uh, you know, um, insects and uh, things below. So from the most complex to the simplest as a kind of hierarchy. Bateson refers to this in the context of the development of evolutionary thinking. So um, the way of thinking about the um, world in ecological terms in a modern sense. And when this is first introduced by Lamarck, uh, it's effectively to invert this hierarchy. So um, rather than um, God being at the top, explaining everything below, the kind of deductive structure. Um, what Bateson says is, actually it starts from the bottom. So, so the um, explanation becomes from the simplest things, 
um, the simplest creatures. And this creates this um, overall picture, this mind, he calls it mind. Um, we can think of it as ecosystem. Um, and that's what needs to be explained. One way to think of an architecture that connects, and for me, is what it would mean to invert this traditional spatial language. Right? So architecture has a tradition of maybe talking about it in one way. It's kind of inverted. And how would you how would we invert that? Um, and I'm not totally sure how to do it, um, but I have a few ideas. And one of them um, maybe is the bottom left here, which is the um, Pantheon in Rome, which is kind of in this top to bottom spatial language, right? Um, but I think you can look at this the other way. So I don't know if you've been to this building, but I think you can read this both ways. It's much more abstract than the building above it that I've shown. Um, you can kind of use this as a piece of architecture to think through um, how the world works in more than one way. And then maybe some other examples. Um, so um, where to start? So on the top right is um, something by uh, Philip Beasley, um, who is, this is quite a technological approach, um, but he's really interested in materials that feel alive. And um, he, this is called the Hylozoic Ground, which is an idea of this, um, well, it's basically the, idea of a kind of material that's living, it's the medieval idea. And um, this has, um, this kind of goes into the idea of uh, living building materials, which some of the discourse on is easily instrumentalized again, um, but I think can also be interesting. And bottom right here is a um, master's project from a um, student at Brighton, um, Davis Mack, which was a tower, the tower was a, a um, set brief and what interests me in Davis's project is developing um, developed a structure around living earth so it's a conventional rammed earth project um, structure kills the earth by ramming it whereas earth is actually alive right it's the basis of an ecology and so he developed an idea for um, building with an earth structure um, but without killing it um, another project at the top left here, Marie's here, and it's uh, Marie's project, um, which is a tree hugger, um, which uh, this is a, a photograph of it in Prague. Um, and the, this is a kind of design for non-human um, inhabitants of cities. And what interests me here, why I put it on this page, is it's not just that this is supporting biodiversity, um, it's placing kind of the non-human and human elements of the city kind of together on the same page, right? They're not being controlled. They're kind of beginning to participate together architecturally. Um, there we go. Um, so I just leave you with this, which is um, a kind of beautiful quote from Bateson's Mind and Nature about stories. And I think in these previous projects I showed, there's a kind of um, way that the, the, the building begins to kind of be a story that we participate in. So it's not, re not being representational, it's not explaining it to us. It's not, um, it may or may not like be doing the, you know, having a functional relationship to um, an ecology, but each one of them kind of begins to be a way of telling a story um, and situating what we're doing, how we're actually living in, um, in this wider uh, ecological um, picture. Okay, thank you all very much. I stopped there. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> yeah, Domina, I don't know if you wanna um, really good. I mean, that was, and because this is also the first lecture, I think it also gives them an idea of, you know, who Bates and Boss. And so, I mean, I, first of all, because, I mean, you guys, I think, have questions. So, anyone want to, does anyone have a question? Um, and we would like to start off with that. Gloria, good. Um, hi. 
I was just wondering, because you, in the end, you were talking about stories and about how the patterns are kind of um, to be understood as a way to, to interact, I guess, more, um, how do you say it, like intrinsically with nature or ecology itself being connected and all that. Um, what is, I mean, a story is always like there's good stories and there's bad stories. How do you make different between, like, how do you know what's a good story? Yeah, great. Um, I think there's maybe two, maybe there's a few ways to think about that. Um, so I think that with, without getting to good story, bad story yet, um, I think the point about the story as like a metaphor for it is um, the story's not a description, right? So the story's not, um, it's not just describing uh, um, we all depend on the earth as an ecology, right? <laughs> like it's not that kind of scientific description. And the way in which is the story becomes something we're part of. And I don't necessarily mean telling a story, but kind of living one. I guess, um, you know, there's our thinking of our lives as kind of being in some way narrative is um, maybe starts to reveal some of the kind of connections. And of course, our um, stories may be, may be good or may be bad, right? In terms of um, the kind of narratives we have to tell maybe just seeing them in narrative, seeing them in stories helps us see those um, connections. So yeah, so I guess there's kind of two senses. There's the whether your story is um, uh, in this sense a kind of um, has a kind of positive, uh, like I can, I, I guess we can tell the story of Mies van der Rohe's building, right? And um, maybe that's a different story to the Hundertwasser building. And these are different stories we can design, but also there is um, maybe the story of Mies van der Rohe building's flooding, right? How we tell that story maybe reveals something else. Um, so I think that there is maybe kind of more than one, my sort of first thought to your question is there's maybe more than one layer to respond to good and bad on. Right. There's, there's what is, um, uh, what does the story connect me to? Um, versus, and then there's how am I connected? And I think, I guess both of the, if we think of designing as a kind of, um, through the lens of story, then, um, yeah, maybe, maybe those two questions we can think about designing better stories. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Ben. And I think to kind of add to that, there is that idea that stories when you can kind of make information matter, right? So like how you can get like a particular information organization to something that is mattering. So kind of a mattering structure to someone, which is very interesting um, way of thinking about, you know, how stories make you think about something in a way that kind of relates. But I would kind of start to use that, um, that, that question on the story and the good bad story to kind yeah. of ask Ben to describe, because I think part of this whole question, as you mentioned, is the kind of ethical, uh, the implicit ethics that is there in, let's say, even our current political agenda. So can you just kind of go into that point of the good, bad story, you know, in the context of what we are having now as the kind of transformation that Europe and possibly also in Britain, um, how would you kind of explain that from that ethical? Yeah. Um... How can so, we start? Uh, just uh, you know, trigger. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, this. It's always very interesting trying to talk about ethics. It's very difficult, and it's because everyone means a huge number of things by the word. Um, and for me, it's always been about um, the processes through which um, these things get worked out. Uh, so I kind of always worry, I, I think first thing for me is to always worry when something seems like a good idea, right? This is, um, uh, 
if something seems like a good, like definitely it's a good idea, then there is the, then it's likely we're being uncritical in our application of it. And if things have lots of connections you can't see, so this is the idea of the um, wicked problem situation, right? Or the ecological situation. Um, you can't control it all. In Bateson, this is the idea of conscious purpose. You're only dealing with a part, right? You're con conscious of this. You're in all these other relations, but you're conscious of this. So remembering that we're doing that, um, we kind of have to always ex be open to examining the consequences of um, that we're not expecting. And I think sometimes when we think, oh yeah, don't worry, I've, I'm, uh, I'm being, um, I'm being ethical, right? Um, in sustainability, we, you know, you, it's easy to think, oh, don't worry, my thing can be recycled, or um, this uses less energy. There's a list of really like obvious good things to do, and when we equate, when we think of ethics just as doing those. Um, Another example is some um, professional ethical codes, right? As an architect, you can go, don't worry, I'm a professional, I've got an ethical code. And what happens when you do that is you're actually exporting your ethical judgment to a code that someone else wrote that you're, you're signing up to. And this means you no longer have to think about ethics, you only have to think about fulfilling the code. And this means you are no longer being responsible for it and you're no longer thinking about its consequences for others and you're, you've externalized ethics into a purpose to pursue. And all of those things to do in your own practice are actually, un, you are actually um, unethical things to um, act on. So um, you're no longer taking responsibility, you're no longer um, thinking of others. So I guess the idea of an implicit ethics to me is, is about how the, moving ethics away from the resolution of the questions which I you know fine in a really simple situation the resolution of the questions is a fine level to operate on but in a complex situation where there's contest over them um, and I guess we only start talking about ethics where there is some kind of contest right but when it's just when there isn't anything controversial we don't need to think in those terms we just do the obvious thing when we kind of really don't quite know what to do, we turn to some other reasoning. When, when we're doing that in terms of um, uh, finding a framework to make a decision for us so we can feel good about ourselves, I think that process of doing that is where we need to kind of think of ethics coming in. And so my way of thinking about this is how do I ask those questions in how I engage with ethics? So how do I, how in everything I do, am I being ethical, not in the sense of ethically good, which is what a lot of people mean, but how am I asking questions that are concerned with ethics? So that are concerned with what the good is. Um, so how do I act in ways where I'm always being responsible not just that I'm fulfilling my responsibilities, but that I'm being responsible for what those responsibilities are, right? And for what they're not. Um, I think we see that a lot in design where you have to kind of decide what's in the scope and what's not. You're deciding what you're gonna pay attention to. This is a huge decision. Um, uh, how do you, act in ways that are always considering what others, um, what the impacts are, right? Not just kind of knowing what the good impact is and then achieving it, but how do you always have, act in a way that's always asking that question? Because you, if it's complicated, you're, as you begin to act, you may need to notice it wasn't like you thought it was gonna be. Um, and I think these, these are all things a little bit, this idea of, um, aesthetic purpose or par participation in these questions. So the um, ethical questioning is a kind of lived thing rather than a philosophical thing which gets applied to discourse, but trying to build this into um, 
build this into the kind of processes we do as designers and also the kind of cultures that our design teams create. Um, a little bit like, yeah, kind of like I was trying to do with those later examples, right? That they're not kind of representing an ecology, their participations in it. Did that answer it, Domini? I don't know. It was a yeah. bit of a... Yes. <laughs> so do we have any more questions from um, anything? I mean, you can ask um, anything yeah. that came, or it could be a statement. Florian, yeah? I mean, it kind of connects to what you were last saying. Um, like, I, I, I understood that you would have to, like, think in the situation what would be the right decision to make and kind of reevaluate your responsibilities. But the scope of information you get is far larger than one person might be able to handle. Like, yeah. it's a team process in a way, or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of hard to do. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I think that the like the questions of negotiation, and I think um, I, I think when we when you kind of approach it from from the ethical rather than the political, it gets even more complicated because the, one of the questions that I don't think you can resolve in ethics is um whether uh whether the good is constructed or whether or not and i'm kind of committed to con a kind of constructivist position epistemologically it makes a lot of sense to me but it doesn't make the same sense ethically because um some people would describe ethics as just what we're negotiating socially right we, we've we have these sets of values in our communities. And they're obviously part of it, but it, that's not necessarily it, right? It's not necessarily just because we've negotiated it, that this is what we think is the good socially, that that is what is good because the social negotiations that create norms also exclude lots of people. They create um, ideas of uh, some people, you know, they have bound, what we call boundary judgments you know, certain things are excluded and included. Um, so, so I think kind of thinking about it as kind of teamwork and kind of negotiation is really helpful, but it's always um, in the context of ethics, I think it's best to see it as um, not simply negotiating the good, but kind of negotiating how you want, to, well, like negotiating, right? Negotiating the um, questions and negotiating the path through the complexity and always trying to think of the people who are not in your team um uh who who have you what what values are implicit in the way you you know your team's constructed there's ideas of exclusion that will be there too um so i think kind of yeah just trying to see trying to always be present to those questions even in how you're trying to address them i think is because there's an approach that doesn't require it doesn't require you to know what you're doing right? um, and it's never going to be wrong to ask an ethical question I don't think I don't think in any possible formulation of ethics thinking about it a bit harder is ever going to be wrong <laughs> so like ways of acting that incorporate that thought into practice um yeah it's a way of negotiating without um when you know you don't know right uh, yes hannah please hi hannah i have or when you how when you say we only um deal with a part or something um and then we already discussed, we all kind of stated the same question last uh, week, but in Bates and talks um, about the search for balance mm -hmm. and that our, um, that the, mach the in machinery, transportation system, all the infrastructure we have kind of distract us for the actual or actually finding or 
being able to um, find this balance. And also when you say uh, we only work or see parts of the bigger, can we even find this balance or how can we? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, so the balance idea is this, um, How can we where to start with this? <laughs> yeah, so say again. How can we at least, yeah, also like what Florian said, we working by yourself is finding or finding this balance only by working by yourself is impossible. You need to work in the collective. Yeah. Um, but still then it's yeah, it's not possible to kind of picture the, the whole or at least uh, bit bigger part of the part you deal with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I don't think you can just, I don't think the way to, or what to take from Bateson is like, oh yeah, we just need to achieve balance. Um, no, no, no. Yeah. He, he met, I mean, I think he, in a way that's kind of his, I, you know, I, that's kind of what he's saying. Like, this is the way that the um, that nature works. We have to kind of work within that. But I don't know if, that's the thing to take because you can't undo the conscious bit so like we're not going to suddenly stop doing that I think the kind of we, we have to plan our way out of um, the crisis right mm -hmm. you can't just uh, um, uh, we can't just withdraw from that it also it's a different crisis from the 70s it does require um, you know, some in instrumental problem solving. Um, and, I th but I think the thing is that kind of, we kind of, if we can kind of find a ways of doing both. So if we can kind of um, find ways to change the kinds of um, technical thinking we're doing so that they, involve they don't involve the the hubris assumption so i think that's kind of possible um so i i you know i think we could design um so every every thing we design has an idea of the world in it um uh, a building has a, a building is actually i think kind of equivalent to an ethical theory because it sets out a way for others to live. Um, I think a computer is an idea of um, how we think, right? And these affect, affect us and affect our discourses. Um, a, you know, think about the invention of the clock and how this changed measurement and our relationship to the sun, right? So we're no longer measuring our day by the sun we're measuring the sun by the clock um so like but we can design we designed all those things and we can design them differently so the like how do you design a railway that uh, i think that was one of your examples right how do you design a railway infrastructure that kind of makes you um that participates in uh the environments it passes through I don't know, but I, I like. I feel like that's a design question that is possible to ask, um, and it could still be quite useful for getting around, right? Um, but maybe it would kind of be quite different. And um, I think <laughs> um, that could be one kind of approach. I think also within the design processes we have the kinds of. Um, uh, you know, the, I think with social, the kind of social ecology, there are methods of designing that incorporate that into the processes that we, that designers go through. Um, this is like the co-design, participatory design kind of framework. Um, the idea is that you are designing with, not designing for. And I think there are maybe ways of um, expanding that to not just human actors. I, I, I don't know if we've um, got those yet because it's very tricky, but um, you know, there are 
ideas of that. Um, for instance, there were um, kind of ideas in the history of cybernetics about biological and ecological computing. Uh, Stafford Beer, who was a management uh, person who worked in management, um, you know, one of his ideas was to control. He worked on like uh, how you manage a factory. So if you think of a factory like an organism, how would you moderate all its um, pieces? Uh, and one of his ideas for this was to use a fish pond. So to use the ecology of the fish pond, which is a kind of balancing mechanism as a way to balance the factory. And that didn't work for various reasons, but there are, um, <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Um, but, um, like ideas like that, I think are kind of interesting. And yeah, building in, uh, I suppose the other thing I wanted to mention for your question was um, the balancing idea is all in the Bateson talks about is about the signals, it's not about the, the materials. And that's a really important point. So um, he has this great idea, great example of a, I think like an amoeba or a single cellular, single cell organism. And if it was working in terms of energy, as it lost, if it, as, it, as it didn't have enough sugar, it would move slower, right? So it ran out of sugar, it would slow down. But it actually gets quicker. The less sugar it has, the quicker it goes because it's looking for sugar. So it's working on, it's not working on the difference, it's working on the news of the difference, or the difference of the difference, right? Um, and this is, one of the ways that the woodland works is not being the limits of the uh, balancing species are not because they're running out of food they're because they're getting senses of okay uh, from the other creatures right it's all if it becomes about um like a loss of habitat and a loss of food you've got a really damaged ecosystem that's going to go all over the place um so so I think that kind of moving to the kind of, the, and this is one of the difficult things with climate change that the, you know, if the action, if we wait for the actual effects we're you know, it's not going to be great. Uh, we've had the information for quite a while, but we're not very good at acting on it. So I think becoming sensitive to those uh, messages is important. Just regarding this isn't, but then isn't also becoming sensible to these messages, isn't the development of the digital world also kind of working against it because yeah we don't go out we stay in our computers we maybe think about theoretically but most people don't <laughs> or they, they hear about it but they don't connect the problem to the actions so yeah totally yeah 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 um and it seems like kind of you know you know recent announcements about the digital world are kind of even more um all, all consuming right um I, I think but again these are things that are designed um i think it, you know computers don't have to work the way they do um digital spaces don't have to work the way they do uh there's some really interesting um ideas about what if you read nine, 1990s ideas about what the internet is like, going to be like they're really quite interesting um, you know, before the internet became about, um, you know, pictures of cats and, um, you know, uh, disinformation, there are some really kind of weird ideas about what the internet could do socially, and I think it might be time to kind of re-engage with some of that too, right? <laughs> and Thank you very much. And I think we can also kind of develop on that. But first, there is um, a, a question here by and um, Jonas, I think, yeah, because I think he he is in some noisy place. So the question is, you mentioned geoengineering and that we only address the symptoms and not the causes of climate change. But what if time runs out and the climate already starts to turn and it is too late to think long term? Do the ideas yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. have any relevance at all? Yeah, I think this is the, I mean, so the geoengineering stuff, I, I, I'd like referring to that because it's so extreme. And um, this, the people who present these don't, you know, that then 
they're not dumb. They know it's treating the symptoms. Um, and it's usually presented as buying time. That's the usual um, idea of this. Uh, and so the idea is you do these things, you buy time to make the other transitions. Um, and I think we could well need to do, well, I think we're already bought into doing some of this. So we're already bought into um, carbon capture, right? Um, if we have to develop the technologies to do that. Um, and that in a way I, I think is much less damaging form than the other things that are mentioned because it's basically removing something we've done. It's not going into the unknown, right? Whereas the, the aerosol injection is, um, doing something that would have kind of lots of ripple effects. Um, but even um, carbon capture, like some methods of do this, doing this, you know, they have big consequences. So one would be to plant a lot of trees. Um, if we planted most of North America's grain fields with trees, you'd capture a lot of carbon, but you'd massively increase the cost of bread um, in the whole world. And so you kind of have to kind of look at what the you know, what are the social consequences for these technical things? And um, so I think the, you know, if we end up doing that, which, you know, something like massive carbon capture is quite likely um, as a, just a need. Um, I think one thing would be just thinking through what, are, you know, what being aware that some of these things are much more predictable than others. So removing something we've done is much better than doing something else, um, but then being conscious of some of the ways in which we might remove it. Um, you know, one is around afforesting the oceans, which I, I think also, you know, very unpredictable what that might do. Um, and I think Bateson's point is we've been doing this for a while, right? Every time we kick the can down the road, so we we um, you know we've been out, out of sync for um, a long time and um, it manifests in different ways and some of those you know more historically were you know about food production um, so you know you cut down more forest in order to get more land for food production or you, you know you invent fertilizers and so on um, these have other consequences and every time we make one of these you know we've been making kind of ad hoc um, solutions for thousands of years and every time we do this we raise the stakes so we mean that we can grow more we can do more that we have um, uh, we're more of an impact on the rest of the more dominant on the rest of the ecosystem so every time we kind of move the move it on in this way we're simply kind of making making the problem then harder to resolve. So I think what I'm suggesting in a kind of small way with the lecture is that, okay, if, if we're doing this kind of thing and maybe inevitably we are, then maybe we also have to do this with an eye on the other. So with an eye on um, doing this in a way that's also a kind of thinking differently. Um, so I, I think we can do carbon capture in ways that are from a perspective of controlling and solving the problem or we could do it in a way that was repairing the earth and to do it in a way that's repairing the earth we maybe need to find different ways of thinking in order to design it and i guess i mean at this point it's also interesting for some of you to take a look at Bateson's discussion on learning levels hmm. and possibly when are you familiar with that enough? Because there is like, you know, how we kind of approach learning. I think this is very important, right? Whether we just kind mm -hmm. of go through corrective mechanisms or this ability to kind of um, see like and pick from different systems. So I guess, Ben, if you can just kind of very quickly tell us a little bit about the uh, Yeah, so like this, um, you know, there's learning things, right? And there's learning how to learn. And then there's learning how to getting better at learning, but then there's also learning to totally change what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that, you know, this is obviously something we think a lot about in education, 
but I think you can also bring this into design, right? I think um, when you design something, people's relations with it is a kind of learning too. And, so for and I, yeah. I kind of want to say what I don't mean by that or the other examples is a kind of raising awareness, like a didactic thing. This is why I put the story thing in at the end. So like, sustainability fail number one is the raising awareness project right oh like we're all pretty aware of what's going on if you're not aware yet there's you know nothing's going to change it at this point um so it's not about like oh i'm explaining to you what the problem is and there's loads of stuff loads of sustainability science and philosophers and so on it's like well if everyone just realized this point everything would be different so it's not that it's about like this participation in the living of our lives as part of the as part of everything which is a kind of cultural change which may or may not have um you know instrumental benefits itself like for projects that it might support biodiversity and so on like they're all important but at the same time or independently it's possible to participate with the world in a different way which is a different kind of it's like a deeper culture change or um, sea change in society a different a way of seeing um the sustainable question or the ecological question kind of from the inside which is not what we do when we explain it um yeah sorry Domini, i wandered away from learning levels but i hope that was okay no, no, that is okay, I think. But that, so that they are aware that, you know, there is, I mean, he had a discourse on that, I guess. And that's kind of helpful for some of these questions. Um, do we have any more questions, like Sonia? No, I, yeah. I, I would like, well, I can do a comment. Uh, thank you so much for your exposure. It was uh, very, it helped me a lot to clear out these things because they are there, but to talk about them and to bring them up and organize them like you did, that was very enriching also. Well, my question would go towards this uh, idea of education, and then it means like it has to change overall. And if we connect it with the Green Deal or the desire of an European Bauhaus, then my question would be this role of the designer that also this project brings forth um, they talk about, we will solve these problems with creativity, yeah. with the help of the designer, no? Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, I think, uh, great question. Um, so yeah, nervously, I guess is how I see it. Um, so the, like as soon as anyone, okay, so I, I think I said already, anything that sounds like a good idea, immediately start worrying, like what's the, you know, look at it again, just make sure. Next one is, if anyone says they're solving a wicked problem, just get worried again, right? Because that's not what happens. And I think designers are, like, we're just kind of used, used to being, having to present ourselves in that way. And that's be actually because of the growth spiral, right? So the growth um, driver, is one about kind of uh, innovation, like, you know, moving things on, doing more things. Um, I, I think thinking of it as problem solving is kind of a like a, a way in that um, is attractive to clients because clients want their problem solved, so problem solved, but it's kind of damaging to thinking. And I guess one of the shifts we need to do is um, about um, kind of moving society away from thinking about things in that way, right? We, I, I, you know, the um, otherwise it lends to the kind of mitigate only the mitigation of harm. Um, so we can, and that's kind of important, right? So we need to um, create less waste. We need to be more energy efficient, and so on. But um, like if they're just like tackled as like, I've solved this bit, I've solved this bit, I've solved this bit, um, 
all of those things could be important, but we're still kind of not addressing the underlying question. Um, and so I guess, I mean, I suppose we need to kind of work on both and need a kind of language where we can work on both. Um, yeah, yeah so I... No, I guess that's a very good point because this language issue is something we're going to also bring up, I think, in the discussions, um, hopefully with the others, is also to kind of look at these policies and to kind of see how, um, for an example, the language kind of promotes a particular kind of thinking and takes away a certain other kind of thinking in some senses, right? And that's what we're going to do with the policy lab also, because I don't know if Ben uh, knows this framework, but they're using something called the CINEFIN, which is interestingly a cybernetic uh, one as well. So, I mean, so we would just kind of listen to them and see. Uh, and for an example, I think some of you, I think she's not here today. Also, Johanna pointed out that, you know, the more than uh, the kind of non-human is also very less present in this discussion. So it tends to be also a very, very humanistic frame. So that's another like a huge um, discussion in the whole new European Bauhaus and also the kind of non-European element in it. Right. So the kind of other perspective and that's something that they really or we kind of collectively have to think about something that Bates and can be very helpful in, I guess, in some senses. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the language kind of goes back to that. And um, so do we have any more? I mean, I guess we have come towards the end of the, the time limit. Yeah, um, there's just one more question in the chat. Um, I can take oh, that. Great, so, great. Leonie, definitely. Um, um, Leonie, do you want to just speak it for me so I can take it yeah, in? Um, yes, okay. that I was confronted with the term of um, metaphor um, in the last weeks, and I'm wondering about this, um, if it is, um, yeah, how to relate to a form in architecture then, is it um, to use the metaphor more in the design process, or yeah, how to, how is the relation between the concrete and the metaphor? Yeah, this is a great question. I was, I, I actually asked exactly this question to someone else about 48 hours ago um, and uh, he's called Dan Lockton and he's working on um, metaphors in design processes and I asked like you know what would this like what would this be like in design outcomes um, so I'd look up um, maybe some of his work um, so I think that So I would come from the, right, so I think you can think about every moment in design in terms of design, not that you have to or not that it's necessarily good, but you can kind of do this and it's a useful trick sometimes. So I can say that I'm designing, let's say a building, and then I'm maybe I visit that building later and in in interacting with the building I'm also designing my understanding of it and it's a similar kind of conversational process you kind of try this or you try going down here uh, and then it doesn't work or it's a dead end and you try something else and when you think of um, the Farnsworth house which I showed it's not a very enriching conversation. We might call it a one-liner, right? So you go there, you know, you think, okay, I've got it. And a lot of buildings are designed like that. They're designed as very didactic conversations, uh, you know, where um, you kind of get them all in one go. Uh, the Renaissance was good at that. You know, it all comes in perspective to you. Um, a lot of modernist architects are like that. And you have other buildings that you just can't quite get a handle on them. And um, I don't know if you've ever, um, Bernie, are you from an architecture background? Yes. yes. I, I don't know if you've ever read Complexity and Contradiction by Robert Venturi. Um, it's actually, I think it's worth reading on this question. Um, it's, it's very uh, visual and he basically presents like, um, presents examples, quite historical examples, where there's more than one thing going on. Like it's kind of, you can't tell if it's a wall or a window or a door, right? It's that kind of thing. Why am I saying this? Oh yeah, okay. So there's a kind of enriched conversation we have sometimes. And 
I think the way I've described that so far is quite formal. Um, Venturi's thing is quite formal. But I think you could also have this um, metaphorically. So and in quite similar ways that you might use a metaphor in a design process, the kind of way that you pick up from Dan. Um, so a building can like support more than one reading, um, have more than one interpretation. Um, it can maybe a bit more be a bit more ambiguous about them. It can ask more for you in filling it in. And I think you know it's possible that. Um, not what the metaphors of, right? Not that kind of didactic sense if you have to decode it, but kind of if the metaphor is like a story, it's something you're kind of doing, um, then that can be this kind of, you know, patterning that connects, right? Um, I think the kind of idea of metaphor in Bates and it's, it's this kind of connection between levels um, and so if you can have ways of experiencing a building that are metaphors of participating in the ecology, um, I think that's a really rich space to be in. Um, I, I had a, a student this year, I was a thesis tutor for, um, called Ed Butterfond. I don't have an image of this, which is why it wasn't in the talk, but he started working on, um, it's the difference between rock and stone so that the living building materials discourse is like a really technological discourse it's like oh we're going to develop these things and they'll you know do these things it's really instrumental but actually stones alive as part as a live part of an ecosystem we don't think of this um it is being broken down by lichen to create um organic or mineral compounds that enable you then to do something else in the in the ecology and what we do when we turn rock into stone is we kill it um, because we clean it and this is the, you know that cleaning of the lichen is actually damaging the you know it's stopping it being ecologically active um, and i think you know that's not something i've really thought of before but i can imagine I can imagine, and Ed's project did this a bit, like a, a space where that kind of becomes present to me. Not that I get, not that it's explained, but maybe I start to understand that and I start to see myself in relation to that. And maybe that kind of, if you can start to see the pattern that connects, you know, the rock and the stone with um, something else I'm doing, maybe this is a way that metaphor starts to um do something rather than explain something and also because you mentioned the rock stone discussion i think in uh, one of uh, peter harris jones books um i think it's the one upside down gods so some of you can take a look at it online there is like a very nice chapter on how kind of Bates and talks about the cycle in in kind of ecological processes and usually when architects diagram these cycles they have like one step right the how the kind of let's say stone ecology transforms and then these are like the cause effect loops are relatively simple so one thing that that about Bateson's like multiple scalar kind of thinking is what they show like from every step to the other step Sometimes there are like these in-between things, right? So the transformation of one part uh -huh. then kind of feeds into another part. And I think I'll, I, I will try to find that part and kind of attach it in the course kind of readings list. So you might be able to see that how we think of that even in that causal feedback loop kind of expands into an ecology in itself. So it's not like yeah. A creates B, which mm -hmm. is something that a lot of this um, geoengineering landscape people do to just kind of show the cycle. But there are in that cycle some information patterns, like some parts of the root might go and kind of affect something else, another kind of, let's say, a chemical structure of something. And these are like all kind of gathered around in multiple levels, right? So these are like trans relations, which even in our circular diagrams, we kind of mix. So I think that's a very interesting thing. So I think when you think of Bates and one thing you can take, take with you is this idea of the multiple. And how do we even start mapping that, relating to that, 
and of course metaphor in that context. I guess that's that's basically it. So if we don't have more questions, thank you very much for uh, being there with us. <laughs> thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah, thank you for all your questions. Really enjoyable. Thank you.